Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming to this wonderful celebration of Jim Le James Lee Burke's work. I think it's going to be a wonderful evening. One of the things that we assembled were uh, so that we could get the in sky uh, scoop on Jim is his very best friends. And so they'll treat him like a very best friend, won't you? <laughs> we just want to make Jim a little nervous, but he shouldn't be. He has excellent friends. We couldn't even talk him into roasting them. Uh, but I think they'll give you some insight into what makes Jim tick and what makes him go on to, to write the wonderful things he does. Our first speaker is one of his very best friends, and that's Rick uh, DeMarinas, and he's also an author. And so with, without further ado, Rick, if you'll step up here and let us know a little bit about Jim and his works. The roast idea is kind of a good idea, but, <laughs> but uh, I don't intend to do that. Uh, although I'll tell you one little story. Back when we were party dogs back in the middle 60s, and we were both instructors up here. Jim used to like to uh, trade shirts. We'd, <laughs> we'd be at a party and, uh, you know, getting down and pretty gritty. And at one point, Jim would come up to you and say, he'd grab your shirt and say, hey, man, that's a pretty nice shirt you got there. Want to trade? <laughs> you bet, Jim. You're my buddy. You can have my shirt. Take off my shirt. We trade shirts. Of course, the next morning, I got an old Air Force surplus short, shirt on. <laughs> and he's got my $12 shirt from Penny's. <laughs> but those, those are the good old, bad old days. <clears throat> and I won't talk about that. I want to talk about his work, uh, which is exceptional, as you know. And... Uh, I'll probably re be redundant about some of the things that were said in the video, but let me just bring you up to date on things. Uh, Jim has written 19 novels and a book of short stories. That's a lot. Uh, and is one of only two writers to re have received the prestigious Edgar Award twice for Black Cherry Blues and again for Cimarron Rose. That's amazing in itself. The Edgar, established by the Mystery Writers of America, is given each year to crime novelists for meritorious work. I think it's highly probable that Jim will receive a third somewhere down the line, and he'll be the only one then to have three. He's also won a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Breadloaf Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and his work has been included in Best American Short Stories, the yearly anthology. His novel, Lost Get Back Boogie, was nominated for a Pulitzer. Okay, you've heard that. But these are some of the highest honors an American writer can receive. And nobody should be surprised about that. Jim is one of the best writers in the country. Let me repeat that. Jim is one of the best writers in the country. <laughs> Notice that I didn't say Jim is one of the best crime writers in the country. He is that, there's no doubt about it. But he's the other thing too, a first-rate American writer of any stripe. And before I say more, let me prove this contention to those who need proof, and I don't think any of you are here tonight, today, by reading a short piece from Heaven's Prisoners. The old Creole buildings and narrow streets never changed. Palm fronds and banana trees hung over the stone walls and iron gates of the courtyards. It was always shady under the scrolled colonnades that extended over the sidewalks, and the small grocery stores with their wood-bladed fans always smelled of cheese, sausage, ground coffee, and crates of peaches and plums. The brick of the building was worn and cool and smooth to the touch. The flagstones in the alleys troughed and edged with rainwater that sluiced off the roofs and balconies overhead. Sometimes you looked through the scrolled iron door of a brick walkway and saw a courtyard in the interior of a building ablaze with sunlight and purple wisteria and climbing yellow roses. And when the wind was right, you could smell the river, the damp brick walls, a foundation dripping into a stagnant well, the sour odor of spilled wine, the ivy that rooted in the mortar like the claws of a lizard, the four o'clocks blooming in the shade, and a green garden of spearmint erupting against the sunlit stucco wall. This paragraph picks the reader up by the scruff and drops him right in the middle of the French Quarter in New Orleans. You are there. 
writer who wrote this is plainly in love with the physical world and he deals with it in a way that a painter deals with landscape, with an intimate engagement that's almost sexual. And how about this? <clears throat> the eastern horizon was strung with rain clouds and the sun should have risen out of the water like a mist shrouded egg yolk, but it didn't. Its red light mushroomed along the horizon, then rose into the sky in a cross, burning in the center as though fire were trying to make, take the shape of a man, and the water turned the heavy, dark color of blood. You see, English prose does not get any better than this. In fact, this is prose reaching toward the condition of fine poetry. This is the upper stratosphere, stratosphere of quality writing. This is the ceiling. Burke's powers of description, narration, and characterization take a backseat to no one writing today. And look how in a few deft strokes he creates a living, breathing monster, a serial killer in neon rain. I tried to envision the man. The face remained an empty dark oval like the pitted center of a rotten piece of fruit, but I could see the simian hands. They were strong, ridged with knuckles, thick across the palm, but they were not made for work or for touching a woman's breast or even for tossing a ball back and forth with boys. Instead, they curved readily around certain tools that in themselves were only discardable means to an end. The 22 Magnum revolver, the 410 pistol, the barber's razor, the cork-tipped ice pick, the Uzi. He loosed the souls from their bodies, the grief and terror from their eyes. He unstuck them from their mortal fastenings, sawed the sky loose from the earth, earth's rim, eased them as a lover might into the wheeling of the stars. Sometimes at night he watched his deeds on the 10 o'clock news, ate ice cream out of a carton with a spoon, and felt a strange sexual arousal at the simplicity of it all, the purity, the strobe-like glow where the, their bodies had been outlined in chalk, the remembered smell of death that was also like the smell of the sea, like copulation, like birth. This disturbing subhuman anomaly has just walked into your life, like it or not. And this is the beauty of Jim's writing. Whatever he describes lights up your brain. But not just your brain is involved. You also feel these images in the pit of your stomach. They make your heart quiver. One more. Now listen to this from his new novel, Bitterroot. Nicky Molinari wore leather hiking shorts rolled tightly around his thighs, alpine climbing shoes with red laces and heavy lugs, and a purple polo shirt scissored off below his nipples. A nest of scars like pink string was festooned on his skin between one hip and his rib cage. On his left hand was a sun-bleached fielder's glove with a scuffed baseball gripped inside the pocket. His eyes searched up and down the tunnel of trees as though he heard voices in the wind. A nest of scars like pink string? I mean, <clears throat> that image burns itself into your brain. Aristotle in the Poetics said this about metaphor. The greatest thing by far is to be a master of metaphor. It is the one thing that cannot be learned from others, and it is also a sign of genius. By this standard, James Lee Burke is a genius, hands down. His is English prose writing, prose writing at its best. And here's what's even more stunning. You can find descriptive writing like this on every page of his 20 books. The man is a firestorm of language. The man is a force of nature. Jim is something else, too. He's also a writer's writer. Every time I read him, I learn something about the fantastic possibilities inherent in mere words. He is one of the keepers of the English language, and God knows we need more and more of them as we get deeper into the era of techie jargon and other bastard forms of this precious language. Being labeled a writer's writer is usually a curse. For a writer's writer is one who is chiefly read and appreciated by other writers. But Jim has eluded this curse. He is also a popular writer, and this places him in a truly rare category, a writer's writer with a large national and international audience that eagerly awaits his next book. And there's one other thing you need to know about Jim. He is a natural born writer. And there aren't many of those around these days. In fact, they are rare in any era. Jim was wired at conception for, writing, for the writing trade 
I think he must have come out of the womb not looking for a breast, but for a keyboard and a ream of 20-pound bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hungry yet, Mama. I need to get some ideas I've been working on down on paper first. <laughs> Even so, his success did not come easy. Jim is one of the hardest working writers on the planet. He's paid his dues. He hung in there during some very, very tough times, a period of 15 years when he couldn't give away his work. His lovely wife, Pearl, was his rock during that time, and now the times are good, Pearl is still his rock. She is the physical embodiment of constancy and courage and sweet intelligence. In fact, I have it on good authority that Pearl may be the rock around which the universe revolves. <laughs> Jim's success is Pearl's success. If what Flaubert said is true, that talent is long patience, then both Jim and Pearl have been blessed with an abundance of talent, and they both deserve all the success they've achieved and all the awards and accolades we can heap on them. There'll be a lot more to come. Thanks very much. Sheesh, it brings the hair up on the back of your neck to hear that literate, wonderful prose. Uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, I just really enjoy. I mean, you could actually paint a picture after you heard those words, and there it would be in deep detail. By the way, didn't you like Rick? Wasn't he wonderful? <laughs> Rick happens to be one that Jim hauled to Missoula and addicted him to the place. So thanks, Jim, for another wonderful citizen to our community. Now we have another good friend who's often cast a fly line with Jim. And he is uh, another excellent good friend. And I believe he's got some more stories for us. And we couldn't get him to roast them either. But here is Russ Piazza. <laughs> It's almost impossible to come up here and follow Jim's own work, but I'll give it a try. It's an honor to be here tonight in a special evening to honor James Lee Burke and to celebrate his work. Uh, so far tonight, we've heard about Jim's extraordinary talent, his monumental contribution to the world of literature, and I think most importantly, his enormous contribution to society. So I'd like to take these few minutes and talk about <clears throat> what I know about Jim Burke, the person. First and foremost, Jim is devoted to his wonderful family. Jim and Pearl have been married for 42 years. And I know Pearl is a remarkable woman who Jim has referred to before, and I quote, his spiritual guide. In addition, I know that Pearl is a spiritual guide for the entire Burke family. Now, I believe truly we would not be here tonight to recognize this great body of work if it were not also for Pearl. Jim and Pearl have four absolutely brilliant children. One, Pamela, lives here in Missoula with her husband, Bill McDavid, who, by the way, supplied the music tonight in the foyer, and their young son, Parker. Now, I believe one of Jim's great attributes and contributions to society is his keen sense of right and wrong and his passion and his great passion for the noble cause. And not only is this clearly evident in Jim's work, but I can tell you that he lives it and breathes it each and every day. James Burke is the most generous man I've ever met. And he's the most generous where I believe it really counts, with his wisdom, with his time, and with his encouragement. And I can tell you, you have never, ever had a compliment until you've been complimented by James Lee Burke. I know Jim to be a humble man, and humble in the best sense of the word. And always, always, the consummate gentleman in the truest, truest of Southern tradition. Now, as you know from Jim's work, 
He does thoroughly love and appreciate all the splendor of Western Montana. In fact, his latest novel, Bitterroot, is a true testament to this. But what you may not know, and what we've had many lengthy conversations about, is how much Jim really appreciates and is grateful for this community we are all part of, Missoula. We've talked extensively about the quality of the people that you encounter here at each and every point of commerce, and a level of trust that permeates throughout this community that is just not found elsewhere, a village with no gated communities. We've talked about Missoula being an intelligent community that attracts artists and appreciates the arts. Now, I know that James Lee Burke has deep roots in Louisiana, but I also know that his heart and his intellect are always right here in Missoula, Montana. And, and with that said, it is my sincere and absolutely humble pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Missoula's own James Lee Burke. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for being here this evening and uh, for the wonderful tribute. It's just, it's just a superb um, evening in my life, and my wife Pearl and children uh, both appreciate it too. Uh, and I wanted to thank, in particular, the um, Arts Council and the Governor's Office and all the people who work so hard to make this evening uh, possible. And you know, Mark Twain once said that. Uh, a person who at the end of his life can count five friends, true friends, uh, is indeed a very blessed person. But I've felt for many years that here in Missoula that me and my family have been blessed with hundreds if not thousands of friendships. And I don't say this in a cavalier fashion. Uh, this is the best place I've ever been. There is no place I have found anywhere in the world, and my travels are limited to, to this hemisphere and to uh, Europe, but I cannot imagine a better place. And I think it's not simply the wonderful scenic environment that we're blessed with, but it's the quality of the people and the level of intelligence and decency and goodwill that has always governed life here in Missoula. And it's the enormous sense of charity that people have here. Uh, you can almost always depend that regardless of the level of severity in an adverse situation, the people in this community, regardless of their politics or ideology or their ethnic background, they always do the right thing. It's absolutely remarkable. So to receive this kind of tribute from the people of Montana is, uh, I just have to say, it's the greatest compliment I've ever had. And the kindness of all your remarks this evening and the fact that in spite of rumors I heard about produce trucks full of rotting fruit being parked out front, no one threw anything this evening. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding, you know. I'm <laughs> You know, I, I, I believe that humility is a, you know, a, an imperative uh, element in an artist's life. But I never had trouble finding it. It always found me like a wrecking ball with spikes on it coming right through the side of the house. You know? But anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't want to run on with this, but my family's from a little town in southwestern Louisiana, New Iberia. It's a small town on Bayou Tesh, but our family has lived there since 1836. But my family is, uh, it's, it's very Irish. I mean, they, and they have all of the problems of the Irish, namely that everything we own is eventually translated into the hands of other people. So every, every time we have visitors to New Iberia, Pearl and I put them in the car and we drive them all around the parish, that's the county there, and I begin pointing out where my great-grandfather lived, my great-uncle, my father, all the relatives, and I always remark, 
they used to own that house and they own that lot and those trees over there and that lumber mill and that uh, boat yard, but it's always in past perfect tense because the Burks never hold on to anything. I've never seen anything like it. And as my father used to say, the mark of a real gentleman is not acquiring money, it is the taste with which he spends it. <laughs> But anyway, it's a, it's a very, there are many similarities between uh, South Louisiana and Montana. They're both, you know, very egalitarian cultures uh, eventually. But anyway, Pearl and I are just very happy this evening, and y'all have been swell, so thank you very much, and God bless you. <laughs>